So I start with a title which is completely incomprehensible, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought I'd start by actually uh, explaining that. So the uh, Grippy P is the name, you heard it this morning, the name of the SDFC funded IT infrastructure in the UK for particle physics. WLCG is the worldwide LHC computing grid. You see the use of the word grid here a lot. It, everything goes back to about the year 2000, and it was, it was a source of lots of money in those days. Right? Um, and of course, uh, LHC is the CERN Large Hadron Collider. Um, I've got a lot of slides here. I'll go through particularly the initial ones quickly um, to try and uh, keep things on time. So I'm going to give a brief introduction, um, talk about the history of why we're doing IPv6. Apologies if you've heard this before. Um, we started with this wonderful idea of doing dual stack everywhere, and I share all the concerns about, is it really working? Is IPv6 working on that? Um, monitoring, we found, is extremely important. We are in an environment at the application level where we're not in control of anything. We're not in control of the networks. We're not in control of the individual experiments. We're not in control of, and so actually, knowing what's going on is very important, and it's becoming more and more challenging and getting at the moment getting worse with time. So we're actually now seeing, even though we've got a large amount of dual stack, we're still seeing a lot of IPv4 traffic and we're trying to understand why that is. And then, you know, what are our plans to go for IPv6 only on WLCG? So the Large Hadron Collider, um, and who am I? So I'm a particle physicist by um, training. Um, I lead the uh, computing group at uh, Rutherford Appleton Lab in SDFC. This is the LHC, the large tunnel. Every, uh, every accelerator has its own airport, which it's got there. Um, we have to share it with the city of Geneva, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> and then there are the four experiments around. This is the 27-kilometer tunnel. Um, so I, on the last slide, it said that I, uh, I've had the privilege of chairing the, the HEPIX. HEPIX is a, a worldwide organization of high energy physics IT specialists where we share best practices and information and try not to reinvent the wheel and occasionally have working groups. And the IPv6 is one of those working groups. Um, so then here's a picture of the, uh, the, the accelerator tunnel at CERN. And the question is, how do you get from this to the announcement on the 4th of July of the discovery of the Higgs boson, which resulted in the Nobel Prize the year later? And of course, the, uh, the answer is that you need not only the experiments to observe what's going on, but you need a computing infrastructure. And CERN has a large history of doing distributed computing. Um, this, the member states like to buy computers in their own country because that's good for supporting the local um, vendors and manufacturers. And so for many, many, many years we've been doing, um, you know, 40, 50 years, ever since the start of CERN, we've been doing distributed computing. And so networking is extremely important because we've had to connect those computers together. And so here you see the worldwide LHC computing grid. Um, 170 sites in 42 countries. The green ones are the tier one centers, the larger ones that do the, uh, the bulk of the data long-term preservation, the data storage. And then the tier twos, the blues, are um, tend to be university labs. Where the physicists, the physicists, the money follows the physicists and the computing follows the money, right? So, so typically the, uh, the, the computing centers are where the physicists are based. Um, so we have a, um, a tiered structure with the uh, CERN has the tier zero in the, in the middle and produces all the data. There are then 14 tier one sites, um, including RAL here in the UK as the UK tier one, and then about 160 university physics labs and other labs providing the tier two services doing different parts of the, of the analysis. So we have more than a million CPU cores, more than two million jobs a day, and there's more than an exabyte of data storage integrated over this whole thing. Grid PP is the UK part of that. Um, we have 19 universities around the UK and research labs. And we not only provide services for the Large Hadron Collider, but also for other particle physics and SDFC funded um, activities. Networking is extremely important, and of course, to connect all that together. So in the UK, we of course use um, 
the Janet network, um, as uh, talked about by Tim this morning. Um, Jayant here is the, the connection of all the, uh, the NRENs in, the, uh, in Europe and then all of the connections worldwide. But we also, of course, use in the US, we use ESnet and Internet2, and then there's Nordinet around the Nordic countries and many other national networks. So networking is extremely important. The data flows were always foreseen to be very large between the tier zero and the tier one. So we have a private, optical private network on leased lines, to like leased fibers to, um, or data paths, uh, between CERN and the tier ones. And you see here currently there's, there's at least a start in moving up to 400 gig. Most of them are connected at 100 gig with a few um, lower speed ones. And then there's also an LHC1, which is a virtual network going over the, uh, the, the various national education networks. And all of this is dual stack capable. And you know, if you integrate the, the bandwidth, you've got 1.9 terabits per second to the, to the tier zero. So what about IPv6 now? So the history, why are we doing IPv6? Um, it goes back a long way. And I start the first, we, we started talking about this in, in anger in about 2010. We had had various talks at various HEPIX meetings before that about what people were doing. The operating systems, as people know, were beginning to be IPv6 capable a long time before then. But I go back to this distributed computing that we've done in particle physics. Um, way back before the, uh, the internet, um, we had leased lines to CERN. CERN became the center of European networking because all the countries bought leased lines into CERN, the member states. And typically we were running, um, I don't know, packet switching X25 networks, running sort of uh, homegrown applications across there. And then as we came to the... Uh, the 1990s, the, the large electron positron machine at CERN was built in that same tunnel that houses today the Large Hadron Collider. And we were using heavily VaxVMS and uh, DECnet as our sort of connectivity. And in those days, we had a global DECnet joint with NASA and the European Space Agency. But again, because of shared sites, it's the usual thing. You get, get research labs that are members of multiple communities. And of course, DECnet was 16-bit addressing, and so even in those days, we were running out of address space, so we had to, re we had to invent NAT for DECnet. <laughs> um, and also, we did this transition to DECnet OSI because uh, everybody was pushing the OSI. People who are as old as I am will remember the, uh, the IP OSI wars of the, of the early 90s, and so we did that. Of course, a few years later, having done that transition, we then moved to DECnet running over IP, right? This is <laughs> But um, so we're not averse to doing transitions. So when it, you know, we were watching all of the discussion about IPNG at the time and looking at, well, there's a transition that we need to do. So we were very concerned that we, you know, we, we need to do IPv6 at some point. So in 2010, we started thinking about it in anger and we, we asked 18 of the, uh, of the major sites, high geophysics sites, you know, are you ready? And so the answer was that Almost without exception, all of the national academic networks were sitting there ready to route IPv6 packets, but none of the universities and none of the labs were ready. We were even then beginning to see lack of IPv4 address space. CERN was complaining that they wouldn't have uh, enough space. We wanted to avoid NAT wherever possible, and we still want to avoid NAT. So the idea of NAT66, personally, I think would be disaster. We want things connected directly. We do the security by other means. Um, and so, and then we were aware that IANA was projecting running out of IPv4 that next year. Um, in September 2010, there was a memo from the US federal government out to the, uh, to the agencies, including the Department of Energy and therefore the national laboratories like Fermilab and Brookhaven that they had to deploy dual stack. So we were aware that there was pressure to, to do um, something about IPv6. We knew that we, could, we may get offers of opportunistic CPU resources that could arrive and be IPv6 only. Um, 
And we were very aware that all of our middleware, all of our software, all of our technology and tools were not IPv6 capable. So we knew that whenever we were told we needed to do it, it was going to take us many years to get there. So we thought we'd better start now. So we started back in 2011. So it's more than 10 years ago. We did a, in those days, we were very naive. We thought we could possibly get to support IPv6 only by 2014. We thought this is simple. Um, it's just a question of making sure that all our applications and middleware are all capable. We'd worked out all the operational security problems that come with IPv6 being new, not because of the problems. Um, and we could start to uh, get dual stack deployed and, and support the um, clients. We ran a test bed to actually do uh, testing of, the, of some of the middleware and the data um, transport transfers. Um, and it was at that point we realized that things were much more difficult. There's a large number of technologies that the particle physics community use on WLCG, and we found many problems. Developers would claim that it's, uh, everything is IPv6 capable, and then when we tested it, we found it didn't always work. Literal I, um, IPv4 addresses, of course, is part of the problem, but lots of other problems as well. And so we then realized it was going to take us much longer than 2014. Monitoring is extremely important. And at that point, we were doing end-to-end -end network monitoring um, using this uh, development of Perf Sonar. And it was good that early on, Perf Sonar made the effort to actually make themselves IPv6 capable so we could actually do the end-to-end -end network monitoring over IPv6. Early on, we wrote guidance on IPv6 security for WLCG sites. And here I just say the challenges. The challenge is that we, nobody's in charge. It's a collaboration. It's a, um, a federation of sites where people want to work together to get it to work. But, and there's a management committee that can, can exclude people if they don't, uh, uh, don't follow the rules, as it were. But it's very difficult to actually uh, tell somebody what to do. And it's true of the, the physics departments in the university. They may want to deploy IPv6 for us, but they're Institute networking team is saying, well, that's not high, not high enough up our list of priorities. We'll do it sometime. So that's one of the challenges that we haven't been in control of the, uh, the, the local site networking. So from 2017 onwards, we decided we had to ratchet things up and actually have a, a mandate from the management board to actually push for dual stack services everywhere. Um, we said that for the tier ones, that had to be by April 2018. And the tier twos, by the end of the LHC run two, which was ending in 2018, we wanted a significant number, a large number of um, tier two storages. So what we wanted to do was we were only looking at the storage servers, the data, to actually get that dual stack capable, because then we could actually support IPv6 only clients, virtual machines, worker nodes, whatever you call them, containers. Um, anything that was actually processing the data and needing to access the data. And they may be IPv6 only, so we needed dual stack on the storage services. Again, this message, monitoring is essential. We needed the network end-to-end -end performance per sonar, and I'll say, unfortunately, I don't have time to say any more about that today. But we wanted to track the number of sites deploying IPv6 over time, and then also tracking each of the data transfers to try and ask the question, if we look today, what fraction of the data is being transferred over IPv6, and hopefully seeing it increasing and getting to the point where it's sufficiently large that we could then turn off IPv4 for that, those data transfers. So let's have a look at the, uh, where we are today with the dual stack deployment of storage. I say nothing about the tier ones because they've been IPv6 capable for quite a few years, and I've got no plots to show that because it's, it's just been done a long time ago. But we're still chasing the, the 160 tier twos. And currently, as of the end of October, 89% of the tier twos now have dual stack, which is, I think, a big, big achievement. Um, if you actually integrate, you know, if you actually weight it by the amount of storage at each site, it's about 91% of the storage. And you can see the four LHC experiments here are slightly different, but averaging over 91%. And so we have 90% done, the green here in the pie chart. 
and then 6% on hold and 5% uh, in progress. Split out by the countries, and here again, this, to, to the presentation we had earlier from France, they were one of the first large countries to completely do dual stack on, the, uh, on their, their, their tier two, so congratulations to them. One of the stragglers is here in the UK. <laughs> We've still got a number of universities who have not yet done it. And it's almost without exception, it's the, uh, it's the, uni it's the, 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 the physics cluster is ready. It's the, it's the university networking department that hasn't been able to turn it on or switch on DNS or what, what have you. So that's something we continue to, um, to chase. Having got to 90%, of course, the management board at some point may just make the decision, well, if you're not doing IPv6, you no longer count as a WLCG site, right? So the ma that's, that's not our decision as the working group. That's a, a, a management board decision to decide at what point will that be true. So here you see the evolution over time. I said that we needed a significant number by the end of 2018, and you see here by the end of 2018, we'd reached exactly 50%. So <laughs> We, we define that to be success and um, um, a significant number. But we've now got, you know, slowly it, 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 people are doing it. But we're now, as a working group, spending much less time on this. There are some sites which are just taking a long time, but that's no longer our concern. We're looking at other things. And we look at the reason why there's the delay. And you actually see here 86% are this thing called the network, which means that they're waiting for the networking team to, at the university, the, the, um, the academic network, the, the national education and research network will be supporting it. It's just between the physics department and their connection to the network, they've still IPv4 only. So I think that's, that's been a, uh, it's been slow, but it's, it's, it is a big success. So then what about monitoring? And this, so I've said uh, you know, th this is very important, and I think there's some interesting things here. So first of all, here's a, here's a plot that CERN showed recently. This is not just WLCG. This is their whole internet access for the last year. And you see that for incoming, then it splits IPv4 versus IPv6. And so for um, Incoming traffic, there's slightly more IPv6 than IPv4, but the outgoing traffic is seven times more IPv4 than IPv6, which presumably means that the, the rest of the world is more IPv4 than CERN has been the dual stack for a long time. So one of the things I talked about, the, the LHC OPN, which is the, uh, the private network connecting the tiers one centers to the tier zero at CERN. And we've been measuring there on a monthly basis the, the amount of traffic on that as seen at CERN um, and splitting it between IPv6 and IPv4. And the good news was that it went up when we started this transition up to about 50% of the traffic um, by the middle of 2019. And then essentially has been flat ever since. Right? There were then some very strange numbers beyond March of this year, which coincided with deployment of some new routers at CERN. And it turned out that the way they were measuring this um, is still questionable as to what's the going on in the, uh, the, uh, the software and the routers. So we still don't, we do fully do don't fully know from March of this year onwards, we don't know what the fraction of traffic is. So this is even worse, you know, having been monitoring something for time and then you get to the point where now we just, don't know, right? This is, but the question is, why, why are we not seeing larger fraction than the uh, uh, than the fifty percent? So then we also at the application layer, the the data transfers. We have this thing called FTS, which is the file transfer service. So this is a third party copy where a, a system can request to the file transfer service, I want you to transfer this set of data, this file, this object, whatever, from server A to server B. And if it's dual stack, it should actually go over IPv6, right? And we were, we, all of that was instrumented. Now, th this is where the, one of the problems, you, you do it at the application layer, you're saying, yes, we're transferring it. So the record that gets written in the, in the audit log is that I've transferred 
50 gigabytes of data between server A and server B, but what's in the log file is the DNS name. And then people say, well, did it go over IPv4 or IPv6? And, well, I don't know. So, so then it, it took a, quite a lot of extra um, work on the monitoring system to actually dig into other logs to actually uh, correlate up with, oh, yes, that did. let's look at the address and let's assume that if the address is IPv6, it went over IPv6. And that was working for what the file transfer service was using between 2017 and 2019. And you see here a nice steady growth from close to zero up to 60% by the end of 2019. The good news was that the physicists were blissfully unaware of this. They don't know what they're doing. It works um, <laughs> at the network layer. They know at the application layer, all they want is their data to move around. Why should they worry about you know, which, which path did the network take, which protocol did it use? And the fact that nobody complained and nobody saw any problems was already um, a good step forward. Right? This is, that's what it should have been. We didn't want them to notice. So then what happened beyond the end of 2019? The experiments decided that file transfers would be much better if they didn't use the old Globus um, grid FTP and didn't use SRMs to, um, protocols and implementations. And they were moving to HTTP, HTTP, HTTPS, and WebDAV and stuff. And so gradually, from about the end of 2019, that this transition towards WebDAV has, has happened. But the WebDAV is not yet instrumented to tell us whether it's IPv4 or IPv6. So if you actually looked at what happened, it went up to a peak at 60% and then started dropping down again. I'll show that on the next plot. The CMS experiment carried on using significant amounts of um, grid FTP and SRM until about the end of 2021. And there you can see it even went up to 90% for that. So that was very good. But we don't plot beyond that because they stopped using, using that. And then you see it here. Um, so for the years 2019 to 2022, the, this is confusing because sometimes IPv6 is yellow and IPv4 is green. But on this one, IPv4 is the sort of yellowy color. And you see it seems to be increasing as a fraction and IPv6 going down. It's nothing to do with it increasing. It's not increasing at all. It's just that we started here with grid FTP and SRM, and gradually WebDAV has taken over. And the reason it appears here is because it's actually unknown. It's not that it's IPv. The monitoring stupidly assumes that if I don't know, I'll assume it's IPv4, which is wrong. So now they're, they're working on this, and within a f the next few months, we hope they will uh, instrument things so that we can actually see what's going on. Um, you'll see here an example where the instrumentation was turned on in August of this year. So this is looking at the two experiments, Atlas and CMS, the two large ones, transferring data into CERN. This is a, a year here. And you see that suddenly, so here, yellow is IPv6 now, this different color from the previous slide. Um, but you see that it appears to be all IPv4 up until here. But now the instrumentation of the monitoring is properly done. You're seeing that actually large fractions of it are on IPv6. So, so we have to fix the monitoring. There's another nice monitoring plot, which I, I, I thought I must show. Tim has just walked out of the room, but he showed it this morning. So this is Imperial. Um, the ability to fill a 100 gigabit connection um, at Imperial, just on LHC1, just for WLCG. And these are the three plots. So this is the data shown by, seen by Imperial. This is the data seen by CERN. And this is the data seen by the Géant network connecting over together. And you see this, this peak at 100 gigabits. So it is possible IPv6 works. We can fill the, the connections. However, why do we still see IPv4 traffic in the time I've got left? So this has been our main activity. Uh, there are many possible reasons. Um, even though the site says that they are IPv6 capable, there may be some storage endpoints that are not. We've got old software stacks around. There could be, and this, is, this has been true in many places, bad con configuration or, or th there are 
a very large number of places where you can say, I want IPv4. And we've quite often heard the story, well, I tried IPv6, seemed to cause a few problems, so I've turned it off again, you know, and there's, no, don't turn it off, come and talk to us, we want to be able to understand the problems and fix them. And there are now more and more data transfers going from the, uh, from the actual CPU machines themselves rather than from the data servers, and a, a lot of them are still IPv4 only at the moment. So we're analyzing them case by case and going through, starting with the, uh, the top talkers in IPv4 to try and understand and fix things. So, for example, there was a case recently where one of the American Tier 2s noticed that even though they'd got dual stack systems, they were, there was a lot of IPv4 data coming in. And it, it turned out this was a default Java configuration. And I don't, don't know default by whom, but there's this thing, java.net.preferipv6 addresses, and the default is false. Right? So we changed it <laughs> when we found it, changed it to true, and we changed it at 5 o'clock on this day. And, and then all of a sudden, this is not just a monitoring fact, these were all IPv4 transfers. And from that point on, when we fixed that parameter, the uh, data is coming in over IPv6. So we've got uh, a member of the team of the working group at, uh, at CERN looking at uh, many of log files and trying to work out what's going on. So here was one where um, looked for a number of transfers, 17 0.8 thousand transfers, and noticed that only 0.1% of the analysis, we'd got production stuff and analysis stuff that the physicists use, and so there were very few that were dual stacked, and so the question was what was going on, and told the experiment, and they said, oh, oh yes, we, uh, we haven't set that to prefer IPv6. So they turned it on, and then looking a few months later, it's already up to 22%. So it's a long, laborious process to try and make sure that when you've got dual stack, people use it. So the endpoint is not dual stack. We're planning for an IPv6 only. We want to simplify the operations. We want to remove the exposure of two, that two stacks gives you to increasing the security problems. So we're working towards IPv6 only for the, the WLCG services. And this doesn't mean turning off IPv4 at all WLCG sites. It means for the data transfers, for the, the workflow, for, the, you know, for the, the main core activities that are going on over the network. We want to be IPv6 only. And one of the, we, we haven't yet defined or agreed the, the timetable for this, but the, the high luminosity LHC, what's called run four, is due to start in 2029, 20, I think it is these days. It keeps going backwards. And having heard the 2030 days of turning, <laughs> maybe we should be aiming for the start of that to actually uh, turn it on. So there are other drivers, quickly. The, uh, there's the lack of IPv4 addresses. People are still saying we don't want to use NAT and we're running out of IPv4 addresses. There's an activity in the research networking um, technical group looking at trying to understand data flows and putting in, uh, and one of the ways of doing that is to mark the, uh, it, the flow the flow label in the, in the IPv6 header, so we want the traffic to be IPv6 to understand it. And the US federal government as well has got this uh, IPv6 only edict to its, um, its, own, um, its own departments, etc. so that by 2025, 80% need to be IPv6 only. So this is a very aggressive timetable here. I don't have time to go through this, but the research networking technical working group, this is, this is the business of, uh, of the packet marking and stuff. And if you need to know anything about it, I'm sure Tim will be able to tell you that he's involved with this work. So I think I've, I've run out of time. Um, there's some more information there. That's our paper on the IPv6 security and two recent, recent papers. And just to show the, the final slide summary, so we're supporting, already supporting the use of IPv6-only clients. We have a number of test sites around uh, who are now keen guinea pigs trying to do it. Um, monitoring is essential, but it's currently broken, and we're fixing it. And understanding why we still see IPv4 traffic will continue to be our priority for the next year or so. And then phase three is our move towards IPv6-only services. 
any new research com communities you come across, our ad advice, for example, Tim whispers SKA, the Square Kilometers Array, if people are setting up, designing new systems, our advice would be do it on IPv6 right from the start, because that then ties in with all of this research networking, um, monitoring the packets and understanding the data flows. Veronica's looking nervous. So. <laughs> the only <laughs> reason is I know that Pete then needs to catch a train, but David, this was absolutely fascinating. Much it's more real story. life for us than Sheldon Cooper. But uh, maybe one question, if somebody's got a question? Or in the pub afterwards. <laughs> yeah, potentially. Uh, I'm curious, a lot, of your, uh, a lot of your statistics are coming from parsing things like logs, which is cumbersome because you're doing DNS resolution on stuff like that. Um, I don't know about high performance computing in general, but do you not have flow logs on um, like IPFIX, SFlow, similar kind of technologies? Yes, everybody can... does. Thousands of them everywhere. How do we integrate them together and understand the picture as a whole? I, okay, this yeah, is, fair enough. I that's the problem. The problem you, you, yeah, okay, fair enough. It's the, is how to do it at what level and... You know, even within a single university, the, the, the physics department will not necessarily get access to the traffic logs of their networking team and stuff, right? So it's, it really is a, a complex problem, which is why we've decided we have to do things end to end and sort of at the application layer and look at what's going on. That makes sense. Thank you. But, but then we don't know in the application logs. What is IPv6, so. I love the message that you keep repeating. You have to monitor. When you deploy dual stack, you have to monitor, you have to analyze, you have to look at it. Because I have seen companies who deployed IPv6 and then I ask them, so how, what is your ratio, V4 versus V6? And we don't know. You know so, and then they don't know what stuff is broken when V6 is not working, right? Well, I resonated with a lot of the statements that Pete was making before. Right? This is, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, David. Okay. This was My very pleasure. good. Thank you for the All the slides are already uploaded on the website. So thank you, David. Thank you.